We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Simon Hunt. He's a consultant in the global economy, China, and an expert in the copper industry. How are you today, Simon? Uh, good. Thank you very much. It's uh, eight o'clock in the morning here in Bangkok, uh, where I'm staying at this uh, wonderful hotel called the Athene. Uh, I I'm here on a working holiday, where I, as I'm based in Dubai. It's always an interesting kind of scheduling issue to speak with you. It's 7 p.m. where I am, so I guess I'm speaking to you from yesterday for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Simon, I it's always nice. I had a good night's sleep. Perfect. That's all anybody can ask for in these times here. Yeah. You know, Simon, it's always interesting to speak with you. Because, you know, you, you really tie in the interactions of, let's say, war, interest rates, global money supply, and how all of that really affects global business and really the barometer for the world economy, which is the, the copper market. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about how you separate the next eras in copper's demand picture. And as we'll get to how that relates to the world and how it really acts as I said, for the barometer of the world in terms of economics, geopolitical relations, and currencies here. So how do you separate out the next eras in copper's demand? That is a huge question, because to answer it, I have to talk about the global economy, domestic politics, uh, geopolitics, wars, and the uh, the development of the alternative global structure to the one that has existed since World War II. So, where do you want me to start? <laughs> well, why don't we why don't we start by separating it out into each of each of these as as I'm calling them eras. So, let's say the the immediate term, and then and then we can kind of talk about all the details. Okay. That, okay. that you bring up within within that, yeah. and then we'll move on to the next one. Um, the background to copper consumption at the moment is that physical consumption is very weak and will get weaker. This is because the global economy, uh, if it's not already in recession, will be in, in recession over the summer months. Um, in America, the various PMIs uh, and the manufacturing sector are clearly in recession. Uh, what you're also seeing is that savings are falling, and the market seems to be propped up by the reported continued high level of employment. The problem with the employment data is which ones do, do you use? Everybody, including the Fed, quotes the establishment survey. And the establishment survey has got two weak points. The first is that it uh, does not take into account temporary workers. And secondly, according to the BLS, uh, the responses to their surveys have been falling. So what is the reliability? Mm -hmm. So we had, and I can't remember the exact number, but for the last month, the establishment survey had a fall in something like 380,000, whereas the household survey had an increase of 310,000. What one also has to remember is 
the corporate response that occurs at tipping points in an economy. The, their first reaction is not to fire workers, mm -hmm. but to cut work hours, working hours. And you can see that from the decline that has been taking place in the weekly hours worked. It's not until recession is actually upon you that corporates start firing. So we will see that over the over the summer months. And I think that will be a shock to a lot of people. So that's much more of a leading indicator. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we have to look at, I mean, Europe is in a political mess. Business is falling rapidly. Germany, in reality, is in recession. The Bundesbank is saying, stop. Uh, we can't continue to finance everybody. Um, in America, I should have mentioned, um, the money supply data continues to fall. In Europe, both M1 and M2 are falling sharply. Globally, the data that we get from uh, Simon Ward in, in London, real M1 is plummeting. Uh, and the latest data also shows continued falls. So you can expect the global economy to continue to uh, weaken in recession uh, through into the fourth quarter. On top of that, we have a big war in and over Ukraine. And the recent attempted coup has made it, which according to some sources, indicates that certain important G7 countries were supporting the coup. It has just given Putin and the leadership in Moscow more confirmation that this is not really a war between Ukraine and Russia, but it is a war between NATO and Russia, led by America. Then you have to go back. What has been America's policy ever since at least 1991? It has been regime change in Moscow and the dismembering of Russia so that America can control Russia's massive natural resources. I mean, I come back to a quip that uh, Treasury Secretary Connolly made so many years ago. The dollar is our currency, but it is your problem. Within a few years, and we'll talk about it later, BRICS will be saying, commodities are our assets, but they're your problem. Hence, you link that to the long-term policy that America has had towards Russia. So to come back to copper, we are seeing physical consumption, despite what you read, being very weak. It is extremely weak in China. Um, nobody of note on the London Metal Exchange in dealing with their physical clients 
is very little business. The business that's being conducted at the moment is by certain people desperate to keep the price up. And in the immediate future, like the next few weeks, stroke month, we may well see copper prices popping up. But that's just a very, very short term trading uh, point. Because by the time we get into the fourth quarter, given what's happening to uh, business generally, and that by the time we get into the fourth quarter, people will have woken up to the fact that since the attempted coup, the leadership in Moscow will have taken off the kid gloves, and this is real war. And the real war will impact um, households and businesses much more directly than it is now. And in the first, Russia? In Russia? Uh, in Russia? No, re the world. Okay. No. Oh. In contrast, the Russian economy is actually doing pretty well, despite what you read uh, from my friends in Moscow. But what this is going to do, which will affect copper prices, is going to cause, excuse me, a massive correction in global equity markets. I mean, for instance, we have a fall in the S&P 500 by somewhere around 30, 35% by the time we get into the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. or certainly by the end of the year. It's at that point that the Fed and other G7 central banks, faced with recession, and a much more direct war will be forced to turn the credit taps full on. So inflation has remained sticky for one very simple reason, that between 2015 and 2022, and I forget the exact figure, but there was something like $250 trillion globally flushed into the global system by central banks in excess of the value of global GDP. That money has had to find a home somewhere. So now we will get the central banks in order to probably save the system. And with an election coming up in 2024 in America and other countries, uh, they will flush the system once again. And if you go back to the Paul Volcker period, it was not the first wave of inflation that was the killer one, it was the second wave. And this is what we will have in 2024 and 2025. We will have horrendous inflation, globally anything 13, 15%. You will have a rapidly falling dollar. In fact, by the mid to late 2020s, we have the DXY virtually halving in value. So we get an inflation of commodity prices. 
exasperated by oil prices probably going to 150 in 2024, caused by supply disruptions. I mean, one consequence of the attempted coup, I'm sure, is that Russia will stop oil um, going, excess oil going to China and India that then found its way in different products into the rest of the world. That will be stopped. So you'll have oil prices rising sharply. Food prices will probably soar for weather-related reasons, particularly the 89-year Glesberg cycle, which is scheduled to hit us either late this year or next year. And if you remember, it caused the Midwest Dust Bowl decade of the 1930s. I mean, it's massive. Mm -hmm. So what happens then? So that leads us into phase two of the copper cycle, long-term copper cycle, because you will get prices rising from the bottom fourth quarter of this year of 6,500 odd to 14,000 odd in early 2025. But what then happens to the global economy? It's highly leveraged. I mean, ridiculously so. And the long end of the yield curve, central banks cannot control. So we will probably see 10-year treasuries yielding somewhere between 10 and 13 percent into early 2025. Well, we saw what 3 percent, a rise to 3 percent, did to the banking system. So basically, this is going to cause, in probability, a depression, certainly a deep recession in which copper consumption collapses, prices collapse, and we're probably not going to see real recovery. You'll get moments of ups and downs, but no real recovery in consumption and copper prices until the early 20. 2030s. That's the forecast that Neil Howe has, which fits our scenario in his fourth turning. And it's only then that we get into the real bull market, where global growth um, it's a period when Countries can live together. Peace prevails. You've got all the nasty stuff out of politicians and countries' systems. So global growth reverts back to the average that we've seen since 1900 of 4% a year. And that corresponds to what copper consumption has done, 4% a year trend growth since 1900. Mm -hmm. So there's your bull market. But we've well, got to have patience before we get there. So it's between, it's a, it's a basically, one, it's a trader's market. And two, the important point is for, not just for copper producers and consumers, but corporations, you've only now got a short period in which to make your contingency plans for what is coming soon. Mm -hmm. So, Simon, there's you know a, a million threads to uh, to pull on there. So, why don't we go back to 
you know, talking a little bit about the the job data in the U.S. that you started with. You know, you you started one of your recent letters with the quote that says, over the last 12 months, the budget deficit has been 8% of GDP, 6% less student loans, while the unemployment rate has averaged 3.6%. Historically, this low unemployment rate is associated with a balanced budget. And that was said by Jason Furman, former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. So how do these job losses snowball into the fiscal situation in the U.S.? comes back to what is the composition of, of, of the jobs. It comes back to what I mentioned, that the your two surveys are violently different. And in fact, if you go back to 2019, the total difference between the two surveys was 2.2 million jobs. <laughs> almost, almost it's there, it's there the in the data. It's not me. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so Simon, what what effect do you think that ultimately has on the U.S. Treasury market? Um, that's a very good question because. The risk is short term. We're going to have. Well, basically, it means that Treasury yields will fall and probably fall quite dramatically, uh, which will take us into the autumn of this year. But thereafter, um, you're going to see rates rising quite sharply. Uh, one issue is that um, the deficits, the U.S. government deficit, will increase, and probably sharply, uh, because the real uh, the the real level of employment will then be f- uh, focused into the market. The deficit rises. Um, you will have a point where the treasury market might actually become dysfunctional. Another reason why the Fed will have to pump cash into the system. Uh, Do you allow the government market to become dysfunctional? No. So you will see in the autumn this complete change in policy, which, as I said, leads into the second wave of inflation. For the Fed, that's down the road. We can meet those problems when they arise, but we have to face the immediate issue. So Simon, when you know, when I think about the treasury market and the bond market, and you think about the interplay that that has on the rest of the world, let's say, let's just take China, for example, how they hold so many billions of dollars worth of US treasuries. If there arises a time where the US treasury market really, you know, becomes this this place where countries are trying to dump their treasuries and or the dollars that you're getting for those treasuries become much less valuable. How do you think a country like China approaches that situation of trying to unload those treasuries, A, while they're still worth something, but B, without, you know, without really in a way, shooting themselves in the foot and not trying to cause more more of a conflict. I'm smiling because Chinese leaders are very long-term planners. Mm -hmm. I think it's probable from my sources that some years ago, 
some years ago, China hedged its treasury holdings with the US banks. So, again, to repeat the quip of Treasury Secretary Connolly, sorry, mate, the problem is yours. I think what China has been doing at least since 2015 has been switching holding paper currencies into financing physical assets such as the BRI. Um, last year, no, 2021, and I think 2022 is more or less the same, they plowed in um, $110 billion into physical assets globally. Um, and then if you uh, look at what BRICS is probably going to do with all these informed rumors that arising out of the BRICS summit meeting in August, late August this year, will be a gold-backed currency. Whether that is a new BRICS currency or whether it's the Remimbi convertible into gold is an open question. But the interesting point is that today you can actually hedge the Remimbi by buying gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Since the start of that exchange, the annual gold disposals from the exchange have averaged 1,900 tons a year. China's holdings, total holdings of gold, physical gold, are north of 50,000 tons, of which something like 25,000 has gone through the Shanghai Gold Exchange into Chinese households and institutions. What do you mean, rest, Simon? I thought it was only 30, 3,900 tons that they had. You're wrong, mate. <laughs> That's the published figure. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest is held by different ministries, of which that small figure is held by the PBOC. I mean, I can give you a personal story to show that a lot of gold is held by the different ministries. A Japanese friend of mine uh, did run a very large company of which about 40% of his revenue came from China. So as he said to me over a lunch, I have to know many important people one of whom was a senior general, he didn't tell me who it was, who invited me down to headquarters for drinks at four o'clock. At six o'clock, he tapped me on the shoulder, walked me across the compound to a large warehouse. And when the doors opened, as he said to me, my jaws dropped because was there stacked from floor to ceiling were bars of gold. Mm. So don't believe that 3,900 tons. And don't forget that China produces about 500 tons a year. Mm -hmm. And Russia is equally the reported number completely understates the reality 
they hold north of 12,000 tons. Uh, the balance from what the um, central bank holds is held in the company, and I've forgotten its name, which oversees the central bank. And they produce four to 500 tons a year too. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, there is a big shock coming uh, from BRICS Plus. And what President Xi said in December to the leaders of the Gulf countries really told the whole story. And I'm paraphrasing what he said. He said, you will hold surpluses and I will hold deficits. And I will hold surpluses and you will hold deficits. How we manage these surpluses and deficits will be through some interstate mechanism. And then he did not elaborate. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how Russia's trade surplus with China is held. It's held, the moment it's running at about 23, surplus is running at about $23 billion a year, dollars a year. It's held in a gold differential account with the PBOC. I think something like that is going to be the template of what uh, surpluses and deficits will be held with the Gulf countries. I think more globally, what we will see is the BRICS bank, the new development bank, holding large chunks of member currencies with, and they've already issued uh, 1.2 trillion of panda bonds in China. And I suspect that the new development bank will have access to the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So somehow or other, um, there's going to be a link there. But the important point is that as more and more trade is done without using the dollar, go back to President Xi's speech, then the dollar's exposure is going to fall quite rapidly. I mean, I've, I've heard that the way that a lot of China holds its gold is privately, you know, through, through its own citizens. Do you think that that matters and makes a measurable difference in any way in the way that that, that is, is counted and or, you know... Well, basically, as I said, you've got in, in very broad numbers, approximately half of what of half of China's gold is held by the public, either households or institutions, mm -hmm. and the other half is held by the government. So, it, so it's it's a a far more different makeup than than let's say the way that Americans and the treasury holds their gold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Simon. And now, now it's very clear that one way or another, gold is coming back, not just as an asset in the monetary system, but as a uh, uh, mechanism to help finance trade. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean that? Gold is actually going to be physically swapped. Does it mean that it backs transactions, creates trust between parties to use? 
whatever this new BRICS currency is going to be. How do you see that actually being facilitated? Absolutely. Definitely. Outside the G7, countries are fed up with America using the dollar as a form of um, enforcement. And when they look at what is happening in America, almost civil war, why, why do we, they ask, why do we need to hold dollars? And when they look at, and I can give you a copper example, since 1980, copper prices have risen by four and a half times and costs by three and a half times. Since 1980, in gold terms, or in grams of gold, copper prices have risen by 48% and costs by 13%. So what have the copper producers received in return? A dollar that today is worth 25 cents. So really their profits have been illusionary. And now they see the prospect of um, a gold-backed currency so our profits can um, become real. And uh, I think within three to five years, most commodity producers in Africa and in South America will have joined BRICS. The other point on this to note is that under one of the options laid out by the Russian economist who is um, in charge of developing the new currency. In an interview, he actually said, any existing member of BRICS or new member coming in will not be debarred should, it, should they default on their loans to the Western system. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a blessing for those countries like Zambia, DRC, and, and all the others. Whose problem is it going to be then? Should, should we coin that the opposite phrase of our commodities, your problem to Simon Hunt? Well... <laughs> Well, you can yes, because I've we'll, actually we'll make said sure, that. I've, we'll make I've, sure I mean, that, that I, I've I've been known to say. So <laughs> yeah, you know, Simon, but it's, it's yeah. accurate. It 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 makes sense considering the way that that you have laid this out. You know, it's it is, let's say, a return to the idea that commodities are a very important part of how the world needs to move forward, and. You know, making a system that seems beneficial by all that need to be involved in it, whether that is commodity producer and or consumer. And think who will have the resources to purchase the best assets when the world is in a really tough situation between 25 and the early 2030s. Those companies that have planned, have been planning for this, 
basically Chinese and maybe Russia too. Well, it seems that they have been, you know, extremely linked and in in a lot of ways it seems like they have a far more longer term view than much of the of the G7 well, yeah. and the West. They are long-term planners. Mm -hmm. The West plans maximum four years. Mm -hmm. You know, Simon, much much ado was made about, about China's reopening here at the beginning of this year. Do you think that much of that economic benefit to the rest of the world, you know, within even the commodity space, with the energy space, do you think that much of that economic benefit was tempered to the rest of the world because of how they have changed their export destinations and where they are now sourcing their input materials? Well, China's economy is going to remain weak for the rest of this year. There was the initial splurge in the first quarter, but no longer. Households are saving. You can see it in the increase in deposit rates and in their savings rates. And they would talk to my Chinese friends, They're just being very careful. And they see the high level of unemployment amongst the young, 16 to 24 year olds, well over 20%. Families have to support them. Um, you've got the demographics where, um, where in 2010, approximately, you had four workers for every retiree. By the time you get into uh, 2040, it's less than two. So households are not spending. Private businesses are not investing. One reason being that they can see that China is laying out contingency plans in case there is a war. Now, through a friend, just to give you the illustration, his factory produces solar panels. And the message came out that part of his factory is being reprocessed to produce components for the military. Mm -hmm. With the comment, this was not just him, it's every factory that can be reprocessed in, 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 in his region. That's a pretty fair illustration that actually um, it's, it's probably across the country, confirming what we've been understanding, that contingency plans are being laid out. And then another interesting um, anecdotal story as to why physical demand is not as strong as it's being made out to be, is that another friend um, did a video from a drone that showed a huge stockpile of unsold EV cars. So when I asked him, you've seen the video, about how many? He said, my guess is something around 500,000. So you then put the story together. The government buys the surpluses from 
the EV makers, put license plates on them, so they then go into the reporting system as sales, and then warehouses them in the open somewhere. My question is, are they doing that with other goods? I don't have an answer, mm -hmm. but it's quite possible to give the appearance that actually the economy is better than it's being made out to be. Well, isn't that part of, you know, in a lot of ways, their their playbook where they built these ghost cities that, that a lot of people are, are familiar with? Well, a lot of those ghost cities, if we go back when there was a big property boom, actually got fiddled up. Uh, but what you're seeing now is a combination of um, demographics, um, caution by households, and and I've forgotten the percentage, a large percentage of households own more than one property, some two, some three, in a period where people are thinking twice about spending money, are you going to see those um, uh, households with more than one start? liquidating, wanting cash. So I, I, I think that the playbook on property, yeah, you will get some stabilization this year, deliberate, in order to prevent a systemic risk. But over the next few years, Property is basically going nowhere. Um, then you've got the government's big worries about property debt, local government debt. So it's it's more a case of. Um, containing that debt, reducing that debt, rather than fiscal spending. So a combination of global uncertainties, domestic uncertainties, has us actually having China's GDP no more than 3 to 4% growth this year, not the 5 to 6 that is being banded around. China's going through a, a, a years of transition from high debt or from growth fueled by credit to how do we manage that credit. If my numbers are correct since 2000, credit explosion, explosion, Credit has exploded by 2,900%. <laughs> yeah, it's a large country and, and you have a significantly larger number of households than anywhere else in the world. But even so, the good news is that that credit has gone into financing and infrastructure, whereas in many G7 countries, it's just gone into financing consumption. But there's this transition period. That was actually something I wanted to ask you about, Simon, was, you know, having as many conversations as I do, I had somebody bring up the idea that China's personal debt load and, and domestic debt load is a problem that could really present itself. Do you see that as the same type of problem as if other countries had that type of debt load? Or does the government have the ability to manipulate it in a different way to be able to handle it? 
Good question. Um, they have the resources to handle it if necessary. So far as local governments are concerned, there will be no bailout unless default is inevitable. With the message given to local governments, it's time you learn to live within your means. So again, that's a negative for infrastructure projects or spending. I mean, to give a simple example was given to me by a Chinese friend. Two senior local government executives, not in a tier one city, have had their wages cut by 50%, five zero. But, you know, think that across the board. It won't be just senior executives, be everybody. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for consumption? I mean, I have a friend traveling in Western China at the moment and was went into um, a shopping mall. Nobody there. Literally nobody there. I guess that kind of flies in the face of the narrative that has been portrayed that China is transitioning to more of a consumer economy then at this point. Yeah, but it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, but it's not going to happen overnight. You know, Simon, one of the other pieces that I really wanted to get to here was something that you've brought up a couple of times, which is the, the demographic problem. Is, is China, you know, you, you brought up that there was four workers for every one. Was In 2010, it senior? and we'll be down to, by 2045, 1.6. Mm -hmm. So is, is China one of the one of the only countries facing a demographic problem like that or are there no. other countries around the world that that you see facing most that as com well? most countries most g7 countries have it mm -hmm. and the worst of the g7 countries is germany so what what do their demographics look like do, do you have any any numbers on those on that um you mentioned a name called Peter before we started the recording. Mm -hmm. He's basically saying that this is Germany's last decade as a power country because there are not enough babies being born to replace those who will be retiring or dying. Mm -hmm. It's... It, It's a huge, it's a it's a global demographic time bomb. You know, I I, I other heard than, other than in most EM countries. Mm -hmm. well, again, come back to BRICS Plus. Who are going to be the members of BRICS Plus? Most of the countries with positive demographics. Mm -hmm. I've heard one of the counterpoints to the demographic, the negative demographics argument that they can export their manufacturing base, like let's say Japan, who has a very aging population, their demographics look horrible, and yet they they exported a lot of their manufacturing to, was it Vietnam and I want to say Thailand or something oh, like that? Across, like, across Asia. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this was, again, Japan's long-term planning. Mm -hmm. Go back to the 1990s. Um, Japanese guys were saying, Looking, look, look at the geese formation. Where did we go? We went out of Japan. China is doing it too. Look at China's investments in Iran's manufacturing sector, I think it's $25 billion. 
Why are they doing that? They're setting up their own factories, their own SOEs, and that then becomes their exporting base, energy plus low-priced labor. In fact, Iran for me is a sleeping giant. Um, you've got this massive investment coming in from China, from Russia, from Saudi Arabia, UAE. And you're already starting to see the signals of growth rising rapidly. Um, copper consumption, that will include copper consumption. Which is interesting to think about because of how how developed of a country that used to be. Uh, you mean Iran? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go back to the early 1980s when an English mining house called Selection Trust that no longer exists bought into the Sarchesma mine in, in, in Iran. With all the rumors going around, this was the start of a major resource development. What's happening now? China is investing $25 billion that will take refined copper production in Iran from around 300,000 tons to over a million tons by 2030. And is that is that the way that they the way that they mine it and or refine it? Like where is that? Oh, it's first of all, it's, first of all, obviously conducting detailed um, development research. Okay. So and it's then, it's then help having develop the resources. Having done that, then, which is obviously I, sus I suspect was with the help of Chinese geologists. So then you get on to the next stage, developing it. Mm -hmm. You know, going going back to our conversation before we hit record here today, Simon, you brought up the the idea that there is going to be a lot of substitution that is lost to other materials like aluminum. So can you can you help you know paint that picture a little bit more of how you see this cyclical you know up and down demand for copper going forward and how much you know just just in the medium term that we're going to lose to substitution alone yeah um the industry's consumption watchdog in a recent industry meeting actually said we've lost approximately 400,000 tons of copper in the last three years. Um, the CEO at the same meeting, the CEO of the world's largest car wiring company, a Japanese company, actually said, we are going to lose 40% of copper wiring in an EV to aluminium. And that substitution has started. Then in January this year, the world's largest aircon maker, another Japanese company, renowned for its uh, reliability. After 20 years of research, have turned all their copper, all their copper tubing into aluminium. Now, Aircon's a very competitive market. 
So you will find that other aircon makers will be forced to follow suit. Cost, price. Mm -hmm. That market is around 2.2 million tons of copper a year. So if you use the template of the car radiator market in the 19, late 70s and early 80s, when it switched from copper to aluminium. So then we can probably see 80% of the market being lost of aircon tubing to aluminium, which would mean, in round numbers, a loss of something like 400,000 tons a year. So that's 400,000 tons on top of an already loss of 400,000 tons. And then in the grid system, the last mile is being lost to, starting to be lost to aluminium. And in some cases, even into the junction boxes and the buildings. So, you know, these are de developments that don't happen overnight. But they then reach a point when, wow. So, you know, then you get all the usual um, substitution effects of switching from high copper alloys to low copper alloys, improved designs that reduce the copper content and we're in that age redesigning things mm -hmm. just a more efficient use of a very important yeah, material absolutely yeah mm -hmm. simon one of the other pieces that i would be remiss to to not ask you about that you brought up at the start and it's it's i know i know we've kind of jumped around all over the place here and I'm sure it's kind of a, a, a yes, bit of an... my my fault. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> in the introductory uh, piece that I had, you asked me to give you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, in my quest to to try not to interrupt, it, it makes for a little bit more of a, I guess, an ADD conversation to listen to. But you know, I, I want to make sure we cover all these points here. You you mentioned that very likely because of the coup that Russia is going to you know in in some ways obviously paraphrasing you be be making the rest of the the world's households and countries feel this war a little bit more how do you how do you foresee that them them going about that well so far putin and the russian leadership have really um, being uh, confronting Ukraine and NATO with kid gloves. Those kid gloves will come off. We will see real war now. And given the known to Moscow of certain G7 countries, being active in supporting Ukraine uh, with um, feet on the ground and all the logistical intelligence apart from the equipment, etc. It'll be a real war. And we will see, probably see Russia moving to the Dnieper River, and then they will stop there, see what the reaction of the West is. And you have to look at the history of, of what Washington has been trying to achieve, as I said at the start, which has been regime change in Moscow and um, dismembering the country. 
So the odds are that NATO, I mean, the, the odds, the risk is that NATO will enter the war more physically by offering troops, fighter pilots, contracts, but without NATO uniforms or American or UK uniforms, mercenaries, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think that's well appreciated in Moscow. So the war is going to become much more intense. And I suspect that any build-up of troops and equipment along the Ukraine borders will be instant, instantaneously destroyed. So we're going to up the war from being a de facto war into a real war. And that's when I think markets will start asking the difficult questions which they're not asking at the moment. There will be no benign outcome. So from the from the other side of that, do you think that is why China is in in, in you know as anecdotally you said is preparing for war? Because do you think that they're going to be... I think be... that's one reason, and I think that the preparation is also in case Washington crosses China's red lines over Taiwan by overtly announcing their support for Taiwan's independence and or shipping sophisticated equipment into Taiwan. China does not want to either blockade or invade Taiwan because with the KMT likely to win the 24 election, then there is the probability that the two sides can find compromises that will bring them together. However, Beijing views Taiwan as part of China. Therefore, if America crossed those two red lines, they will be forced to move. So, contingency planning. So is that, you know, Russia, Ukraine versus, let's say, NATO and Taiwan being the the only two real hotspots that you're considering at this time for for conflict in uh, in the near not future? right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Watch out for the Straits of Hormos. And, and Iran, why Iran too has prepared contingency plans if, for whatever reason, Israel stroke America decides to attack Iran. Mm -hmm. They have already planned what they will do, which will include shutting the straits down. And don't forget that they have acquired the latest anti-ship missiles from both Russia and China. Are those hypersonic weapons? I don't know. They don't have to be. <laughs> well, Simon, I think I think we've covered covered many things here today. Do you have anything else that you think is worth bringing up before we wrap up here? 
I think my final comment would be to both households and companies and institutions, there's not much time left for planning or contingency planning for what's going to be a very difficult period between the mid-2020s and early 2030s. Well, that's the the whole reason we aim to have these difficult discussions on this show is to try to help educate people on the possibilities of these global shifts and what they can do about it and hopefully take a little bit of action in that direction because I don't think that people are worse off for for yeah. at least learning about it and hopefully taking a little bit of action well on one one yeah. one way your listeners can keep in touch with uh my thinking mm-hmm. is i have a website simon-hunt.com on which there is a newsletter twice a month And of course, you know, my research is for, for today's discussion is, is based heavily on those as well. So it's, it's quite a, quite an interesting perspective that you have, Simon, because of, you know, how, how globally connected you are and how many different people that, that, you know, throughout these different industries, how copper affects and is affected by all of these different forces and and the perspective that you have on these these different currency markets from where you are in the world and it's always an interesting read well thank you very much for having me on it was a pleasure answering your difficult questions well simon i i appreciate you taking the time out of out of your day and your 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 tennis lessons to to answer those questions well again thanks a lot and bye for those again, that's his his newsletter is available at simon-hunt.com. Simon, thanks so much for your time today. Pleasure. Thanks. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.